All right, everybody. We are starting on slide 19 of the Unit 2 PowerPoint. So here we go, um, learning a little bit about price elasticity of supply. So that's going to be our main topic here. Once again, we're talking about the responsiveness of sellers to changes in price. So we have the same deal, elastic supply and inelastic supply. We know that with inelastic supply, producers are not going to be responsive to price changes, but with elastic supply, they will be responsible for price changes. Basically what we're doing is learning almost exactly the same thing as we learned with elasticity of demand, just from the supplier's side. So same sort of ideas will apply. Uh, we're going to have um, elastic supply whenever the coefficient is greater than 1, and inelastic supply whenever the coefficient is less than 1. Our um, formula is pretty much exactly the same. It is, just like we learned, it is stuff over money. So we have the change, the percentage change in price of the product is on the denominator and percentage change in quantity of the product is in the numerator. So exactly the same formula. We just, everywhere that we saw a D, we put an S. Everywhere that we saw quantity demanded, we put quantity supplied. Now, the determinants of supply are, um, are very simple. There's really only one, and that one determinant is time. It's all about the time, oops, it's all about the time that they have to react. So we look at three different time periods, the market period, the short run, and the long run. Now, when we talk about this, it's not about like physical time, you know, days, weeks, months, years. What it's about is fixed and variable factors of production. Fixed and variable factors of production. So um, a fixed production component is something that can't be changed. Um, and a variable production component is something that can. So if I've got my um, my farm and I'm you know I'm I'm a farmer like always in my examples and I have a 20 acre farm and I grow corn on those 20 acres, I can vary how much fertilizer I use. I can vary how much water I use. I can even vary how many people I hire in order to come and harvest my corn. But that 20 acres, that 20 acres is pretty fixed. I got 20 acres to deal with and I can't change that very much. Okay, now in the long run, eventually, I can buy the next door neighbor's farm or I can sell my farm. So that's the difference between the short run and the long run. In the short run, all I can change are these variable factors. But in the long run, I can even change the fixed factors. Because in the long run, there are no fixed factors. So in the long run, there are no fixed factors. Everything is variable in the long run. Now, in the long run, we or I'm sorry, in, uh, in the market period, we have what we call perfectly inelastic supply. Okay, And what perfectly inelastic supply looks like is a vertical supply line. Meaning, if demand changes from D1 to D2, then suppliers, they can't change anything. Okay, this is immediately, in the market period, everything is fixed. Nothing is variable. So when the price of a good changes based on a shift in demand, so our P goes from P0 to PM, there's nothing that the farmer can do about it. Okay, he's already planted, he's already watered, you know, the, maybe he's even already harvested. So the price shifts and he is purely a victim of that change in the market. That is perfectly inelastic supply because, of course, does he have any time to react? And the answer is no. There's no time to react in the market period. Now, in the short run, we don't have that same vertical supply curve. It is upsloping like we would expect. Now you'll notice that when demand increases from D1 to D2, we now have an increase in quantity supplied, okay? So part of this increase in demand is absorbed through an increase in quantity, 
and part is absorbed through an increase in price. Okay, but the, the upsloping non-vertical nature of our supply curve in the short run is what makes this change down here, this increase of quantity possible. Of course, if we do this the other way and we look at a decrease in demand, then we would have downward price pressure, but in the short run we could choose to plant fewer crops, for example, and we could decrease that quantity supplied. So it works exactly the same, just the opposite, um, in the short run. Now, in the long run, everything is variable. All factors are variable. So this means that the, the farmer, when demand increases, has the ability to not only buy more fertilizer and hire more laborers, but he can also he can also buy more land. Okay, so you notice that our, we're still upsloping, but we are more gently upsloping, meaning more of this demand increase is absorbed through increased quantity and less of the demand increase is absorbed through increased price. So certainly the price goes up and that's you know why quantity supplied is going up but since the supply curve is less vertical we have more of an increase in quantity. Okay so in the long run which is you know what we consider this time um, thing but remember we're not talking about days weeks months we're talking about time to react and the reaction is changing the amount of fixed versus variable factors. So what are we interested in? Why does this matter? Well elasticity of supply has these uh, has these implications. We can talk about it in terms of antiques. Obviously the, uh, the Willem de Kooning uh, painting that we talked about, part of the reason that it was so valuable is because of the pure inelasticity of supply. The artist has passed away. He only made one thing that looks like that. There's no hope of creating another one. Perfectly inelastic supply. Therefore, when demand increases, so perfectly inelastic supply, when people decide that de Kooning, you know, is doing a better job and one person increases demand, whatever that person's willing to pay, and it's only the one person who's willing to pay the most, that price just drives up and up and up because of the perfectly inelastic supply. Now of course once we get to better and better technology where we can make better and better um, uh, better and better you know reproductions and prints and things like that then we're going to see those getting a little bit more elastic and then we have the inelastic supply of gold so it's it's relatively inelastic it's not purely inelastic because of course we can go and mine for more but given that supply curve and the sort of wildly changes in demand, wildly changing uh, amount of demand for gold, we do get a lot of volatility there in the gold market. The next kind of elasticity is a little bit different. It's this idea of cross elasticity or sometimes cross price elasticity. So in elasticity of supply and elasticity of demand, we took absolute value, we ignored everything. But in cross price elasticity, we do have to pay attention to the sign because the sign is going to tell us whether we're dealing with substitutes or complements. Now you know what substitutes and complements are. We've already dealt with that. We've got our, our typical substitute example is Pepsi and Coke. Our typical complement example is peanut butter and jelly. Now we want to know, for example, how complementary two products are or perhaps how substitutable two products are. So would you expect Coke and Pepsi to have a positive sign? The answer, of course, is yes. We know that they're substitutes, and that would be a very large number because they're very close substitutes. We also know that when we get toward the closer to zero, the more independent our goods are. So this would be, you know, when the price of peanut butter changes, what happens to um, quantity? So the, let's, let's look down here, right? when the percentage change in the price of, pe of peanut butter goes up by 10%, what happens to quantity demanded of bowling balls? And we would guess that bowling balls would change, the, price, the uh, quantity demanded of bowling balls would change very little. So if we have a positive 5%, right, and then a 0%, 
what are we going to see? We're going to see zero because these two goods are unrelated. They're independent goods. But if we see, on the other hand, that um, maybe we see that the price of Pepsi, whoops, that we see the price of Pepsi goes up by 10 and um, the change in Coke is plus 20 percent, then that's going to give us a positive 2. And that's going to show us that these are substitute goods. And then the higher the number, the closer the substitute. So a perfect substitute would be, you know, a, a change of 1 would give you a change of 1. So an increase of 1 percent would give you a change of 100 percent, for example. That would be a perfect substitute. As soon as you change the price at all, you have a big, uh, a big difference. And now obviously we can do the same thing in the other direction for complements. So when the price of, pardon me, when the price of peanut butter goes up 10% and then the quantity demanded of jelly goes down 20%, then you have a negative two. And that of course is going to tell us that they're complements. Once again, the higher the number, the more complementary the two things are. So um, our applications here are, you know, should we change the price? As Pepsi, should we change the price? The closer the, the substitute, probably the less likely we are to change price because Pepsi knows that if they raise their price, then they're going to uh, give a lot of business to Coke. Okay, now also the government uses this when they decide if they should allow a merger. So since Coke and Pepsi are such close substitutes, it is unlikely that the United States government would allow Coke and Pepsi to merge because then those two things would, get, would vastly increase the market power of the new corporation. The last thing we're going to talk about is income elasticity. So you also know what these words are, normal goods and inferior goods. This is the mathematical way for us to figure out if a good is normal or inferior. So let's say that my income rises by 10% and then the amount of, of uh, uh, ground beef that I purchase increases by 20%, then I have a positive 2. So that means that ground beef would be a normal good. Okay. So basically what that means is you know, as, um, as I make more money, I eat more burgers, I get more ground beef. But now let's, let's take a different example and let's say that my income goes up by 10% and the amount of spam that I purchase goes down 20%. Hopefully you guys are old enough to know what spam is. Spam is this gross uh, meat substitute that comes in a can and is awful. So obviously what you're going to see here is a negative 2. So the second that I can afford to eat fresh meat that's not gross and made of raccoons and such, um, I'm going to avoid spam. And that's what that negative, time, negative sign tells us. This is going to be useful because it's when we have high income elasticities, we're going to know that a recession is going to be a very scary thing. When income goes down, um, those people who are selling normal goods, they're going to worry. Okay, um, but if you've got, you know, low or negative income elasticity, then you're not going to be very affected by a recession. Here is a really nice chart that takes those relatively complicated ideas of uh, cross-price elasticity and income elasticity, puts it into a nice chart form. Um, now, elasticity and pricing power, this is an interesting idea, and what it allows for is what we would, we're going to deal with a lot more later on, but when you go to the movies, why is it that adults and children and even senior citizens uh, can pay different amounts? And the idea is elasticity. Okay, so children are going to pay lower amounts because everybody can just, um, you know, tell them not to go. But adults, on the other hand, when they decide to go to a movie, they're they're going to go. And especially with children, once children go, so as a parent, once I tell my kids that they can go, I have to go. So what the movie companies will do is suck in the children with cheaper fares because they know that the adults have to come with them. 
Likewise, senior citizens, they get discounts because everybody, uh, everybody knows that you know, if, you, if you have all sorts of flexibility, then you can go whenever you want. So you can go in the morning, you can go in the afternoon, you can go in the evening. Whereas adults who are working or children who are in school don't have that same amount of flexibility. So the elasticity gives you the ability to do this. Business air travelers, of course, also wind up paying more. So this is why you know the whole two-week deal comes into effect in airlines. If you buy your ticket more than two weeks in advance, typically you're going to pay a lower price. Business people often don't know two weeks in advance where they have to be, but vacationers, they often know, say, six months in advance. Okay, so elasticity has these pricing power ideas as well. That does it for chapter four. We'll see you tomorrow.